So welcome to this traffic safety webinar sponsored by the North Carolina Governor's Highway Safety Program. This is one in a series of webinars addressing topics of interest for traffic safety professionals. The series is co-hosted by the Institute for Transportation Research and Education at North Carolina State University and the University of North Carolina Highway Safety Research Center. Today's topic is combating creative defenses through investigation and expertise, and is presented by Paul Glover, who's the retired head of the state's forensic test for alcohol branch. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Sarah Garner with the North Carolina Conference of District Attorneys, who will introduce our presenter. Sarah? Thank you, Eugene. Can you hear me all right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Folks, um, rather than go too much into Paul's uh, resume, which you can see up here, and the training that he's had and the experience that he's had, I just want to speak real briefly about Paul. I've known Paul for quite a number of years and I've got to say when I've got a question about something that is completely off the wall, Paul's my first phone call because Paul has heard every off the wall that there is. I also, um, there have been several occasions and, and Paul, I, I know you can acknowledge this too. When I've had TSRPs from around this country that have called me with questions and issues. And Paul is the one who can come up with the answer. So when folks have a problem in Oregon, Paul Glover's the one that solves it. Paul has testified in court before when I've had the pleasure of being the prosecutor and his courtroom demeanor, skill and ability is just wonderful. And juries just sit there and listen to, uh, sit there and listen to Paul all day long. He and I, when we discussed this particular webinar, had decided that what Paul should do is exactly what I find him so useful for, is uh, explaining to me crazy quirky stuff that creative defense attorneys come up with that are outside of science, outside the law, but still have to be dealt with because sometimes they're very good salespeople. But Paul is, along with being a good uh, witness, which is a form of sales, um, the product that Paul is selling is the truth and the product that he's selling is science. And I think you're going to find this to be very enjoyable. And Paul, my friend, it's all you. Paul, if you'll unmute your microphone and share your screen to begin. All right, looks like we're going now. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to do this presentation today. I hope people find it interesting and helpful. Uh, my contact information is there on the screen with my email address. Uh, feel free to contact me if you have questions or if uh, you need clarification on anything that I do, anything that I say. Um, my background is real brief. I went to Florida State University, which I had a defense attorney question me on that one time. And afterwards I said, why did you do that? And he said, well, I didn't wanna ask you any other questions. I figured that was the safest question to ever ask you. And so I had a good laugh after that and we went on. I've been a reserve officer in Durham uh, for 35 years now. Um, it's just part of my volunteer work that I was started back then and I still continue today. Um, what I used to do when I was with forensic tests for alcohol, I did some research uh, that kind of got slowed down because of the administrative responsibilities, but we would review breath test issues, we review blood test issues. I did in-service training for both the FTA staff and for uh, new district court judges, uh, for prosecutors. Uh, I worked with um, the prosecutors uh, on doing some of the regional training for law enforcement officers and ADAs. Um, I would evaluate the individuals who wanted to get an application or submit an application to be able to test blood for the presence of alcohol or impairing substances. That typically would be the SPI lab or some of the other um, local uh, labs that we had a crime lab for some local jurisdictions. Um, I would evaluate those individuals. Um, and then if we were asked to help with the case, and I would coordinate the assistance for the prosecutions, uh, and so it would involve my field staff that I had back then, or myself. Um, so it was pretty much a, a full-time, you know, keep you busy from, from eight to five kind of job. Um, 
we uh, we did law enforcement training, public awareness, electronic support, scientific research. We had the DRE program was part of our program and the standardized field sobriety test um, oversight. Uh, so we stayed really quite busy. Uh, now I'm retired. That's the first thing I say when I get on the stand now, when they said, what do you do? I go, I'm retired. I don't have a whole lot to do. I do have to wonder what day of the week it is. That's my biggest challenge a lot of times now, since I don't go to work away from the house. Um, it's actually fun. All of you can look forward to this at some time in your future. So the overview for today um, is a couple of topics. GERD is one of them. Everybody's heard of GERD, but we're going to go into it and make sure you understand it. Uh, hot blood and expirations, that's always important. Post-driving consumption, which seems to be, I would say, a little bit more on the increase, and we have to consider that a bit more than we used to. Um, diabetes, Sarah put diabetes in there, uh, primarily because the people have it, and people want to make an issue of it, but it really is not a huge issue. And then I have some of what I call bits and pieces um, that I will throw in in the end if we have enough time, some stuff I think you'll find interesting. So the challenges I've dealt with over the years, you would not believe, and I decided I would just go ahead and put a list of them here because you just are going to think I made this stuff up. But jet fuel, somebody said they blew a 0.15 because they were exposed to jet fuel. Toothpaste, mentadent toothpaste caused some guy to blow a 0.11. Snuff, any of you people who dip, um, this guy had wintergreen flavored Copenhagen or something like that. He claimed that's what made him blow what he blew. Varnishing the barn was one of the ones. Um, GERD has been one. Dentures have been an issue. Airbag dust. They want to say, well, the airbag went off and I inhaled the dust. And when I blew the dust, that caused me to have a result. Um, VCR head cleaner. Now, a lot of you out there don't know what a VCR is. Um, Back when we first got electricity, we started getting some devices that we could watch non-live shows called video cassette recorders. Uh, those no longer exist, but people would have to get cleaner for the head of the VCR. And that caused somebody to blow whatever they blew. Rubbing alcohol. Uh, one guy used rubbing alcohol on his arms to claim that that's what caused him to blow what he blew. I believe he blew a 0.24. Um, I had to do the experiment where I, I wrapped paper towels around my arm, poured rubbing alcohol on it, wrapped it with saran wrap, left it like that for a half hour to see if I would get any kind of result, which of course I didn't. Um, aside from the fact that the next day the skin fell off my arm like I'd been sunburned, um, but no alcohol result. Carburetor cleaner, um, that caused somebody to blow it. Seafood buffet, not the carafe of wine that this guy drank, but the seafood buffet got him. Diabetics, um, cough medicine, mouthwash, and the Atkins diet. Those are all the challenges, not all, but nearly all that I've gotten over the years and, had, and, and dealt with in court. Um, none of these have any validity to them. So today, our list of topics for today is not long, but to really go into depth on them would take hours on any one of them. We can't do that. So in a, in a one hour webinar, which this is, I'm gonna to try to hit the high spots so that we can uh, make sure that everybody has an appreciation for some of what I cover. If you become aware of a defense claim that concerns you, start looking for resources. I can't encourage you enough. Start looking and don't wait until it's the morning of trial. That, that happens all too frequently. Um, this uh, webinar is, has a, the terms investigation and expertise, and it's correct. Um, investigation starts at what I call the initial encounter. That could be a vehicle stop, it could be a crash, but the investigation doesn't stop that evening. And I, I can't stress that enough. You have to maintain your investigation all the way through the trial. You would be amazed once again at how many times you discover more information the closer you get to trial. So don't stop investigating the case. Most or the most crucial evidence may not be obvious to you. I've had times when people have things in their reports, they had no idea how important it was, but because they were conscientious, they included the information that was crucial to the case. 
some things that, that are recorded in your notes um, are common sense. And kind of like they tell jurors, we don't ask you to abandon your common sense when you enter the courtroom. You've got to use common sense. Um, officers need to re use common sense and so do prosecutors. Finally, <clears throat> if you've got issues or concerns or you're puzzled, get somebody with the right expertise to help put your puzzle together. Um, it makes everything go a whole lot easier when you'll do that. So gastroesophageal reflux disease, that's what GERD is. Um, it also gets put in some English journals as G-O-R-D. Uh, they use the O in front of esophageal instead of the E, but GORD or GERD, it's the same thing. So what are we talking about when we're looking at, at gastroesophageal reflux disease? Start out with reflux. It occurs in virtually everyone every day. Don't forget it. Everyone every day has reflux. But typically, these events are very asymptomatic. Uh, my wife has said she's never had it, it, experienced anything like that. Uh, and that's because it's asymptomatic in most people. Um, only when reflux becomes uh, troublesome, and troublesome is a term that's used in the diagnosis of diseases. When it becomes troublesome, then it's called a disease. So it goes from being reflux to reflux disease or gastroesophageal um, reflux disease or GERD. Statistics vary. Some say GERD affects 7% of the population. Some say the number is 28%. So we're saying everybody has reflux. Those who finally get diagnosed as having the disease end up being seven to 28%. That's a significant population, a portion of the population. Reflux is not new. I look this up again, and I date myself, but when I was a kid and we watched TV on black and white TVs, um, I can remember Bromo Seltzer ads. That was not, I wasn't watching TV in 1888, but Bromo Seltzer has been out as a product for reflux and indigestion since 1888. So reflux is not a brand new thing. It has been around since we've been eating food. Um, but it's not a problem for alcohol breath testing. And there are a number of reasons that it's not a problem. Uh, both breath, blood and breath alcohol testing have been being done for a long time. We all know that uh, blood testing started way back over a hundred years ago. Breath testing came along after that because it was less invasive. We don't have to poke holes in people. Um, if reflux had been an issue, then we would never have been able to establish breath alcohol testing. And I'll say it again, if reflux had been an issue, we would never have been able to establish breath alcohol testing. What was done back when they were investigating blood and breath is they were looking for correlation between a breath concentration and a blood concentration. And they found that, and we have our ratio of 2100 to one who currently use. If reflux had been a persistent problem when it came to doing breath alcohol testing, we would never have gotten any kind of a correlation that we could say, okay, this is representative of a blood result, which is what was being done when all this started. The, the concept of correlating a breath concentration with blood would have been flogged. You could never have done it if reflux was going to be a problem. Um, that's one of the ways that we know that reflux isn't a problem. Part of it is physiology, the reason that it's not. Part of it is the instrument sophistication. If we look at some of the basics for the physiology component of it, and I, I put my disclaimer in, I'm not a doctor. I've read enough of this stuff, I can explain it. I'll try to use non-medical terms because those are the ones I know. Um, but we have what's called a pharyngeal complex. That's the back of the throat, back where your trachea that you breathe through and your esophagus is behind that, where they join together is at the back of your throat. That's the common area for those two pieces of, of your body, the trachea and the esophagus, they join back there. Um, it is a phenomenally well-designed airway protective system. You use it every day, all the time. I'm gonna use mine right now. When you go to drink something, you have to protect your airway. The 
Life as we know it is not compatible if we put food and liquids into our lungs, it just doesn't work. And so this protective airway system is there to keep stuff out. Um, it keeps stuff out, whether it's going down the esophagus to the stomach or whether it's coming out of the stomach up the esophagus. Uh, retrograde transit is a term that's used in a lot of the papers on this topic. Uh, retrograde transit is when stuff's coming from your stomach and coming back up the esophagus. You can think of it as regurgitation or vomit or any of those colorful terms, but retrograde transit describes them all. Um, it's an important process and it's an important concept. What I want you to do, nobody's watching if you're watching this by yourself. If you take your finger, forefinger and thumb like I'm doing, you grab yourself by the throat below the jaw and then swallow. And when you swallow, what you're gonna feel is that hard structure that's um, basically where your Adam's apple is a little bit higher. You're gonna feel it move up before you can swallow. When it moves up, it causes the epiglottis to fall forward and cover the trachea. Uh, anytime stuff is going down your throat, down your esophagus to be specific, then that, that structure moves up. It closes off the access to your lungs and you can send contents, food, solids, liquids down your esophagus into your stomach. The other side of the coin is when stuff is coming out of your stomach, as it moves up, it causes that same complex to move up. It covers the trachea, and now you get a mouthful of it that was down in your stomach, but it doesn't go in your lungs, and that's the most important part. Another way you can try this, if you would like to um, at, at home, is try to blow air out of your mouth and swallow at the same time. Now, some of you are going to get confused by this because you didn't to go to your science classes, but take a candle, a birthday candle, set it up, light it, blow at the flame gently. You can blow the, the flame. What I want you to do while you're blowing that flame is try to swallow. What you're gonna find out is you cannot constantly disrupt the flame while you're swallowing. That's the airway protective complex kicking in. And so anytime there's going to be stuff coming up from the stomach. It causes the flow of air from your lungs to stop. Huge, huge point for breath alcohol testing. Um, and here, as I said it again, I had it on this slide, sometimes I get ahead of myself, but it blocks the flow. That's the physiological reason that gastroesophageal reflux is not a problem. We have a brilliant instrument in North Carolina, the Intox ECIR2. I think it's pretty brilliant because it was designed with some very simple things in mind and they work. In order to get a sample of breath in North Carolina, you have to blow 1.5 liters minimum of breath into the evidential instrument. If the instrument detects a 20% decrease in breath pressure prior to blowing 1.5 liters, it stops the test. Now that's pretty simple. 20% decrease, the test stops, okay? If that epiglottis falls forward because your pharynx complex moves up and you cut off the flow of air coming out of your lungs, that's more than a 20% decrease. That's like a 100% decrease in the, in the pressure. It stops the test. If you are able to maintain that pressure for one and a half liters or more, as soon as the pressure drops 5%, then the instrument takes a sample for analysis. So you've got to provide your breath sample uninterrupted for one and a half liters in order to have a sample that gets captured and gets analyzed. You can't interrupt that flow with anything coming up from the stomach. It's simple as that. Another thing to recall or to, to be aware of is that before analysis occurs, the breath sample has got to go through about 24 inches of tubing to get to the sample chamber. If you add the distance in the back of your throat, mouth area, you're adding another four inches. You're looking at 28 inches of transit. If something comes up in your throat right at the end of a blow, there's no way it has time to, to move 24 inches to get in to be captured um, and analyzed. So uh, it simply can't happen. That's, that's the big part. So what happens if you get some contents into your mouth? 
to the retrograde transit, there was a significant amount of alcohol present in the mouth prior to providing your breath sample to be flagged as mouth alcohol. So if you still have alcohol in your stomach, you erp it up, you got it in your mouth, um, you have mouth alcohol in there. If the analyst is aware of it, then they have to start a new observation period that's mandated. Um, but it's not going to jump up into your mouth in the middle of a breath sample that you're providing and influence the result. Finally, there have been a few studies and publications on GERD, um, not a lot, but there have been some. And one of the things that uh, they've, they've said is, uh, I'll say the take home message, is that the risk of increasing a breath alcohol result due to GERD is highly improbable. So the, the experiment these folks did, they took people who have GERD, they gave them some alcohol to drink, they put like a, a sophisticated inner tube around their stomach and they could pneumatically punch the person in the stomach when they wanted to. So they would punch it and cause contents to go up the esophagus and they tried to influence the results. And the short version is you can't, they could not um, get a false high result in this experiment. I think they looked at about 10 people. So here's what officers need to pay attention to. Did the subject complain? Um, a lot of people who have GERD or experience a true GERD event complain about the discomfort. Um, I take uh, Prilosec. If I get skipped for two days, I know it. It is not pleasant. Um, it's a for real thing. So if somebody doesn't make any complaint, if there's no issue with them during the interview process, the arrest process, make a note of it. Um, did you get a PBT result? Okay. Did you get evidential results? All right. How did all of those compare? If they're all backing each other up, if you're basically getting 08 or 910 in, in a series or 08, 08 or 910, I don't care what the sequence is. If they're all within point of two of each other and you're not seeing any aberrations, then you, you didn't have a result that was influenced by anything. Um, and that means a proper breath sample was provided. Obviously, we've always said when that test record ticket says, um, reported alcohol concentration, a proper test was completed. So let's move on to blood alcohol. We have hot tubes or lack of refrigeration and we have expired tubes. Um, I have to throw in some war stories with a little bit of this so that you can understand uh, where we get the um, motivation to do some of the experiments that we end up doing. Here's what happened, there was a crash and I can tell you it was in Lee County and I can tell you it was quite a few years ago, but there was a crash. Uh, and there was a fatality, unfortunately. Um, uh, the officer did an excellent job from the standpoint of his investigation. He got a blood sample. Um, it was properly collected, but he left it in his patrol car. He had a wooden, little neat wooden box in his patrol car that he would put junk in. And he went on vacation for three days. And when he came back from vacation, he goes, holy smoke, I left the blood sample in the car. So it was analyzed and got a result. I wanna say it was a 0.15 is my recollection. Uh, the defense raised the issue in court. Uh, I had actually another fatal case I was working in Wilmington at the same time as this, and I wasn't able to be at this particular trial. But the, the, the judge who was trying the case um, had no issue with all the results going forward. The defendant appealed the case uh, the Court of Appeals found no error, and it was the state of uh, North Carolina versus John Walker McDonald. It's a good case to keep in your in your briefcase. Um, but my way of looking at it was, yeah, we survived that case, but this is not going to be the last time. It's never the last time. I said, there are going to be more people who are going to be putting tubes in cars and forgetting about it. So I said, let's do an experiment. Um, we we're going to dose volunteers. So I got volunteers to do what we, a normal control drinking exercise like we do in our classes. Uh, we dosed them. We also had non-drinking volunteers. Uh, we took their blood. We had a doctor and a nurse present uh, and collected blood. We took 10 tubes of blood out of each participant. Uh, we also breath tested them, but we, um, we were primarily interested in their blood. Um, we decided we would treat the samples exactly like they're treated in the field. 
We put them in a cigar box and we put them in a patrol car. We put one box uh, on the back seat. We put one box, we, because we had so many samples, we put another box in the trunk of the car. Um, we left it in there. And I bought some temperature measuring devices or recording devices, and it would record the temperature. And I think it recorded every 15 minutes. Um, we recorded out to uh, 78 days, so we left samples in there. We started out, we pulled samples after three or five days and seven days, 10 days, maybe 20. And then we just waited till we got way on out to like 70, 78 days, something like that. Um, we would take the samples out. They were randomized. They were numbered so that no one knew which sample had alcohol, which ones didn't. Um, the results were that the samples that were treated in this manner did not gain alcohol, as some defense experts will claim would happen. In fact, what we saw was we saw about um, between 10 and 15% and decrease in ethanol concentration. If we repeated this experiment, and when we repeated it, I took additional tubes, and some of them I put on ice immediately. So I could take them to the SBI and have them analyze them with them having been on ice all the time. Um, and then I had some tubes that I left out at room temperature. And what I found out was that even at room temperature, there's loss of alcohol. Uh, and apparently there's a little bit of, um, I'll just say biological activity going on in the tube where you lose you can count on 10% of the alcohol that's there being lost, regardless of the starting concentration, we're gonna lose about 10%. So unless someone were to collect blood from a subject and put it on ice immediately, take it to the SBI on ice and have them analyze it on ice, it's gonna to go to room temperature at some time. Um, and it is going to be, um, it is gonna go down. There's just no getting around it. That's part of life. And that's part of what we discovered. But the other important part, part is that even being exposed up to 145 degrees in a patrol car, um, that didn't cause an influence of uh, the decrease. And in all of the non-drinking samples or samples from non-drinking people, there was never ever any alcohol shown. So this notion of creating alcohol um, by it being unrefrigerated just isn't true. Um, and there I said, regardless of the initial concentration in the range of about 18 milligrams per 100 mils was a loss. Um, so we move on to another blood issue, and that issue has to be with expired tubes. So you know on your vacutainer tubes, it's got a lot of fine print. If you get your reading glasses out and you read it, you'll see that um, most of them will say use before a certain date, or it may say expires, but a lot of them will have a used before date. So this defendant was arrested Christmas Day, Merry Christmas, um, in 2002. And of course, as the officer was interviewing him, he clutched his chest. This was in Charlotte, out on one of the highways there around Charlotte, clutched his chest, ah, ah, you know, take me to the hospital. And so he was transported to the hospital. They collected blood. I mean, implied consent blood. The tubes had a used before date of October 2002. Now, you can see on the same screen, December 25 is when he was arrested. October was the expiration date. Um, well, somebody had a problem with that. The defense expert said the results should be disregarded because it was collected in a tube that was expired. They should be disregarded. We got a letter from the manufacturer of the tube. And what they said is that using expired tubes would not impact the result, which is what we knew all along. They also said the biggest bugaboo with expired tubes is loss of vacuum. As you know, all these tubes are typically glass with a rubber stopper um, and the stoppers go bad with time. And vacuum, it's an imperfect seal. And so with time, air will get pulled into the tube. They don't want somebody in hospital setting to be grabbing a tube to take a blood, pop it on there and get nothing. Because as you know, if there's no vacuum, you don't get any blood. 
if you use an expired tube and it sucks the blood into it, then there's not an issue with the, the functioning of the tube. It has a preservative in it. Preservatives don't go bad. It has an anticoagulant. If it stays liquid, then it's not going to, um, it's not an issue. You had all the components you needed. You got the blood in there. It's not a problem. Uh, they, they wanted a jury instruction and the judge wouldn't do it in the Court of Appeals. And this particular case said there was no error. Everything was fine and dandy. So that's another one to keep handy. Um, one of the things to remember though, is that if the only tube you have is an expired tube, then go ahead and use it. Don't go, oh, no, I don't have a tube. I'm not gonna collect my evidence. Collect, use it to use a tube. If you can, check your, your boxes, check your tubes, wherever, you, wherever you're using, what your supplies are. Look for ex expiration dates, avoid using them, change them out before the dates. Then you don't have an issue that has to be litigated. The other popular event that's going on now is called post-driving consumption. So what is post-driving consumption? Uh, here's, here's a real good example. Subject has a crash. He claims he consumed alcohol after the crash while still on the scene. I did a trial in Moore County. Um, guy ran off the road. So it was kind of a crash, kind of not a crash. And troopers got called and got there. When we go to trial, the guy said, well, he drank a 12 pack of beer while he was waiting for the trooper to get there. Um, this could have been a problem except when the trooper was questioned on the stand, uh, were there any beer cans around in the truck, around the truck, anything like that? And more importantly, he asked if the uh, defendant ever asked to go to the restroom in the two hours and 45 minutes that he was in his custody and the answer was no. So the jury didn't find this particular claim as a credible post-driving consumption claim. You get some that may be somewhat credible, but um, you still have to, you still have to be mindful of a post-driving consumption claim. The other type of, of claim I run into is the subject flees after the crash, runs off the road, runs, rolls over, hits a tree, does whatever. He gets up and he runs. He either goes home or friend's house or in the woods. I'm not quite sure where he's finding the alcohol in the woods, but for some reason, there's always a ready supply of alcohol out in the woods. And so that's where these guys go for their alcohol. So why do we have to be concerned about it? Well, we are guided obviously and controlled by our North Carolina general statutes. And one of the general statutes that we have to deal with is definitions. And when you look at this definition, it says relevant time is any time after the driving, that the, after the driving that the driver has in his body alcohol consumed before or during the driving. And I put emphasis on before or during. That means if we know that he drank something after, we can't consider that particular alcohol. So how are we going to deal with that? Um, we're going to do a real good investigation. This means you've got to take notes. You've got to write this stuff down and you've got to ask some questions. So document what the defendant claims. Uh, I know there are times that uh, there's a tendency to discount what they say because you say, no, that can't be. That's total BS, couldn't have happened. Regardless of what your opinion is about what he claims, write down what the claim is because someone else is going to have to evaluate it down the line. Document what's on the scene. Now, we, we had a, ca a case a few years ago. That was a drug impaired driving case. There were pill bottles on the floor, but because they had blood on them, nobody would collect them. So we never got the benefit of knowing what pill bottles were on the floor. Document what's on the scene, document what's in the car. If there's um, broken bottles, if they're unopened, if they're, if, they're no, if there are no containers around, make note of that. Um, it's important and it will become important. Do a PVT on the subject, record the results and the time. Now, I know a lot of people don't record or uh, PVT results because they go, well, we can't use them in court. We can use them for a lot of things. It can't be used as evidential um, information, 
but it can be very, very helpful. Trust me. Also, do a PBT, do five minutes between, make sure you record the results, make sure you record the time. Make notes with respect to any behavioral changes in the defendant. If he says he drank a beer after the crash, we're not gonna see a big behavioral change. If he says, I drank a Jim Beam glass or a jelly glass full of Jim Beam right after the crash, we're going to see a behavioral change because he's gonna be getting drunker. Um, has to happen with that kind of consumption. So make sure that you make notes about all of that stuff and write down the defendant's weight. Uh, that's another huge one. And it's probably the most frequently missed piece of information that I need if I'm evaluating a case. On your DWIR form on the front page on the upper left-hand corner is a place for gender and weight, please write down the gender and write down the weight because we're going to need it down the line. Um, makes a big, big difference. So here's how we approach it. If we get a, a post-driving consumption claim, we're going to establish the timeline of the event. So we wanna know, okay, was this a crash or a vehicle stop? We'll write down the time of that event. Be conscientious about using a correct time. Establish the time of the breath test or the blood collection. That's always our end point. Um, calculate the number of grams of alcohol that were allegedly consumed. So if you've done your job and the guy says, I drank a half a bottle of wild turkey and it's a little, you know, uh, gosh, I can't remember, 12 ounce, it coming in 12 ounce bottles. If it's, a, you know, whatever the size bottle, document the size of the bottle, document however much um, was claimed to have been consumed in any way you can document it, do that because we can figure out how much alcohol he consumed. We have to calculate the number of grams for that particular alcohol. I think it's 9.34 grams for an ounce of 40 proof alcohol. We look at the number of, of um, ounces he would have consumed. We calculate how much, um, how many total grams of ethanol he would have had. Then using Widmark's formula and the defendant's volume of distribution and his weight and the added alcohol, I can calculate how much what he says he drank would have added to his BAC. Using Widmark formula and the defendant's volume of distribution, typically for a male, we'll use 65%. Um, That's what percent of his body is water. Um, his weight and the added alcohol, then I calculate what his BAC would have been, would have, what would have been added to his BAC by that consumption. Um, I didn't subtract that. So real quickly, if I if somebody has a 0.15 for a BAC and whatever they says is that they, they drank would have added 0.02 and I subtract 0.02 from the 0.15 and I get a 0.13. Now I've got a corrected value, all right? I can do that. I can say, this is the most that would have influenced it. Now, as is in a lot of these cases, if they flee the scene, I may have some elapsed time where they've been eliminating. So I'm gonna to have to add back what they would have eliminated. Uh, and, and so frequently it's interesting that the amount they said they drank is also the amount they would have eliminated. Um, essentially the result is whatever the measured result was. We, we would subtract the added value um, from the BAC, and if there was zero time, then there, obviously there's no time correction to have to do. Um, but that's how we do them. Now, here's a real, real creative post-driving consumption challenge. There's a crash. Uh, a near amputation of the arm. Left arm is outside the window, apparently when he lost control. Driver's side of the car smashed into a tree. Arm was there because of the evidence on the tree that came from the arm. Um, so while he's in the car after the crash with a near amputation, he goes, hmm, I've got a bottle of Johnny Bootlegger in the back seat in a brown bag. I'm just going to reach. I'm going to reach the back back here, and I'm going to get this bag in the back seat while I'm bleeding out. And I'm going to take this bottle out, and I'm going to take this bottle of Johnny Bootlegger, and I'm going to unscrew the cap. 
I'm going to drink it down. I'm going to screw the cap back down. I'm going to put it on the floorboard and then I'm going to get out of the car and then I'm going to put a tourniquet on my arm. Oh, there was no blood on the bottle. So you're bleeding to death and your first thought is I'm going to drink some Johnny Bootlegger. It just was just a crazy, crazy, um, in my opinion, creative post-driving consumption claim. And do you know why we were able to do such a good job of knocking the legs out from underneath this thing? Because the officer took pictures. He had no idea this guy was going to make a post-driving consumption claim. But in the pictures of the interior of the car is the bottle of Johnny Bootlegger on the floor with the screw cap back on top of it and not a speck of blood on it. Now, if you have a near amputation of your arm, I think you're going to be bleeding. Um, is it impossible for this guy to have done this? No, it's not impossible. Is it very likely? I would say not very likely at all. Uh, considering it's most frequently we use two hands to unscrew a cap and why you would want to put the cap back on it unless you're just a real neat nick, I don't know. So um, you don't know what you're going to get with these cases. Uh, make sure you collect all the evidence because we just don't know you know, we had no idea this was going to turn out to be a post-driving consumption case until we went to trial. Diabetes, um, Sarah wanted me to put diabetes in here, and it's good just as a real short refresher. It's short and sweet. Diabetics can produce acetone. If they're going into a diabetic event, they're breaking down fat. They're going to end up making acetone. That's when they're supposed to get the fruity, sweet breath on uh, that's acetone, kind of smells like nail polish remover. Um, the evidential instruments we use in North Carolina will not respond to acetone. That's the short version of it all. That's how we know that the result would not be because of a diabetic event. If they blew a 0.10, it's because they had alcohol on board. But the other thing to keep in mind, and this is your observations, you have to maintain the whole time you've got this guy in your custody is that an untreated diabetic event will only get worse. So if he's going into a bad event because he's having a diabetic event, he's going to get sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker until there's intervention. Um, if that didn't happen, uh, I don't believe there was a diabetic event going on at that particular point in time. Bits and pieces, this is uh, kind of some, toward the end of this presentation, um, pieces I want to be, stress. And this doesn't have to do with a, with a defense claim, but time, correct times. Time is always an important component. Make sure you record the time of events accurately. I can't stress it enough. I believe that the uh, DMV 349 software populates a time whenever you initiate that report, which is probably handy. However, I have gotten packets from prosecutors that would have um, a rights form, an incident report, a citation, a DMV 349, um, somebody else's statement, maybe a CAD report, all these different things. I have gotten as many as five different crash times for the same case. If you looked at all the documents I had, it couldn't have been five different crash times, first of all, and the times varied not by one or two minutes, they varied as much as an hour apart. Um, a few people have trouble still uh, converting re regular 12 hour clock and military clock. If you can't do a good job of it, then just write down what the real AM PM time is, because sometimes I'll get um, an event and a, the breath test would have occurred two hours before the stop or the crash because people don't record their times accurately. I, I can't think of any crime that time is not a crucial component. Um, this is an area people could improve upon. Uh, I, I would encourage you write down, double check your times. Uh, and the DMV 349 is one, I, I understand you can go in and manually put in the correct time. If you can get a dispatch time, if you take that much effort to get a CAD, time for when they received a call about a crash, it would be tremendously, tremendously helpful. The DWIR form, 
the years ago it was called the AIR, Alcohol Influence Report. And then we came up with TWI, uh, Driving While Impaired Report Form. There are still a lot of you folks that don't use it. It is a very good tool. There's a reason for every one of the questions on there. Um, I think if you use it, you should do a better job. If it makes you ask questions you may not think about, it makes you collect information that may not be meaningful to you, but could be meaningful to me or to another person who's evaluating the case. Um, you can get the forms for free from FTA. Uh, at least that's how it was when I was there. I encourage you get the forms, use the forms. Um, did a trial in Asheville one time and defense attorney asked the uh, officer involved, he said, uh, uh, this is your, your report here, isn't it? But, uh, oh, oh, the backside is blank, is blank. Is this really your form? Oh yes, yes, that's my form. I didn't need any of that information on the back. He may not have needed it, but there are other people that may well need it. So collect the information, get in the habit of it. You'll do a better job. Fill in all the blanks. Don't forget that upper left-hand corner where the weight goes. There are a lot of times I need the weight for my calculations. Um, we end up having to find a jail entry, you know, when they get weighed, when they go to jail and we can find some weights, but we, we can't always find that. Write the weight down, it's important. Be wary of attributing a characteristic to an item that isn't correct. Okay, what do I mean by that? You're at the crash scene, you didn't see the crash, you touched the hood, the hood is hot. And that's a pretty good take home piece of information. You can touch a hood and see that it's hot. If you're sitting in your office right now or someplace, I'm gonna ask you to do something. Everybody can watch if they can see. This is a stapler, okay? I just picked up this stapler. This stapler is cool to the touch. I mean, it's been sitting here longer than I have and it, it's cool to the touch. I just picked up this mask. It is exactly the same temperature as that stapler. It is not cool to the touch. This um, cool to the touch is a real, real elusive concept. Because this is metal, it feels cold because it's pulling heat out of your fingers. And that's why you're feeling like it's cold because this is a piece of paper and it's, it's almost like a piece of insulation. It doesn't feel cool because it's not pulling the heat out of your, your fingers. But when you pick up a beer can and you go, oh, this is cool to the touch. You're suggesting with that, that it's cold. And if it was cold, somebody was drinking it. And if it's not cold, somebody was drinking it recently, you don't have a clue, you really don't. So this cool to the touch thing, think about this stapler next time you wanna write down it's cool to the touch. If it's sitting in a bucket of ice in the car, if it's got condensate on the outside of it, you can make note of that, but I, I just would say, be wary of attributing a characteristic to an item that isn't correct. Um, is it really cool? I don't know about that. Um, being uh, burned in a crash does not create a BAC. Um, uh, there are some, some national newsworthy events in New York State a couple of years ago where a subject was burned in a crash and they had a BAC that was, again, a high BAC. And the defense folks put out, now obviously this person wasn't charged with anything um, because they were killed. But the defense folks in community put out there that she would have had a high BAC because she was burned. I'm sorry, burning blood does not create alcohol and give it a BAC. It just doesn't work that way. So even a subject who might get partially burned in a crash, they're not going to generate a BAC because they were burned. Um, these little things pop up and then nobody ever addresses them. They kind of take on a, a meaning of their own. And finally, you're not likely to know what the defense will be at the time of the arrest. I mean, you've seen a defense get spun up right in court at the time of trial. You don't know what the claim will be at that time because they rarely have their wits about them on the scene. They don't know what they're gonna to wanna to claim. So because you don't know what it's gonna be, you should always do a complete investigation. Write down everything, record everything. Even if it doesn't seem like it's important to you, it may be important to me or to someone else. Build up your expertise. You don't always have to have an expert in, but use your brain, use your abilities, 
learn from your cases and build up your expertise. Ultimately, you may have to call in an expert in the case, but if you know what you've got for a case to start with, well, you may be able to be persuasive um, with respect to what's going to happen with the case, whether a case is gonna be let out, um, whether you just do a better job and present a better case to your prosecutor, build up your expertise. And finally, get help when you need it. I, I got a call, and I always remember it years ago, and it was hard to understand on the phone. And I, I asked the caller, I said, are you in the, you sound like you must be in the hallway. Yeah, I'm outside the courtroom. They call me, the officer called me wanting help with the case, calling me from the outside hall of the courtroom. That's kind of late. It's kind of hard for us to help at that point in time. So get help when you need it, get it sooner rather than later. And I believe this is my last slide and I will turn this back over to the moderators. Paul, thank you very much for a terrific uh, and entertaining presentation. Let me bring up my um, uh, Q&A screen here. All right, so hopefully folks can see that. So we do have some time um, here for some questions. Uh, just a reminder, uh, if you've got a question, you can type it into Q&A, or if you'll just uh, raise your hand, um, I'll call on you um, to speak directly with Paul. Let me invite uh, Sarah Gardner to rejoin us as well. Uh, Sarah, we do have a question uh, in Q&A, if you'd like to take we that do. one. We do. Paul, here's, here's a, this is a good question. The breath test testing instrument, particularly the one we use now, the ECIR2, is smarter than people are and will refuse to function if, if something is wrong, if something is, it is, is not going to give you an accurate result. So the question is, since we've been using breath testing instruments that detect residual mouth alcohol for about 30 years, why, what is the purpose of the observation period? Why is that written into the, into the regs? Um, the, the observation period is there um, kind of as you're, you're wearing suspenders and a belt. Um, we know the instrument will detect it, but what we want to do is make sure the person is absolutely um, free of alcohol, no access to it. In reality, we know probably 45 minutes to an hour elapses between uh, most arrests and most mm -hmm. tests. And most police officers I've dealt with and worked with have not been given beer or liquor to people when they're being transported to jail. So we know they've truly, truly been derived of any kind of alcohol. Um, but by having the 15 minute observation period, we know from testing that uh, it will dissipate. So there won't be anything there. This is a way just of further documenting that uh, deprivation period. So it, it kind of helps to reduce the issues for in court. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then you, you were talking about, you know, driving around with the blood in the back of the patrol car and things like that that do happen. Does it need to be refrigerated or is it preferred that it's refrigerated? What, what are your thoughts on we, We've never put out a position on that. And what I have seen through the work I was doing is that even if it was at room temperature for three days, and let's consider putting it in the mail to the SBI. It's not mm -hmm. going to be refrigerated. Um, you're, you're going to lose, if you figure you're going to lose about 18 milligrams per 100 mils, regardless of concentration, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to go down unless you could cool it immediately and keep it cold all the way to the point of being analyzed. Um, it's really not going to do any good. That's really the short version. Well, and, and just from a prosecutor's perspective, as a general rule, if, if the if the blood is going to be refrigerated, then that's going to be part of a protocol within a law enforcement agency. And just from a chain of custody perspective, rolling around in the back of a patrol car is not really the best situation for us to come up against in court. So, you know, I, I, I prefer refrigeration, not because of the temperature, but because of the security. Is that I, fair? I think if you have it controlled, and that's where when somebody takes custody of it and they then either put it in the mail or they hand carry it, um, just because you know where it is the whole time. Most agencies do have a refrigerator for biological mm -hmm. evidence to go in. I'm just right. saying there's likely to be a couple hour window in there when it's not gonna be refrigerated. Right. There's, there's gonna be some loss, but it, but that's always been the case. And that's always gonna benefit the defendant. It's Correct. not gonna harm them. Correct. 
Okay, got another question here. Is there documentation about the it, whether or not there's any difference between the results of a breath test and a blood test? For example, if I'm blowing into the ECIR2 and you're simultaneously drawing my blood, are we going to get the exact same result? Um, in theory, you would. In, in reality, we know that breath test tends to underestimate blood test by about 0.01. Okay. I mean, that's that's really been established a long time ago. They are you know, a 0.08 blood or 0.08 breath are equivalent for mm -hmm. pastoral purposes here. Um, but we know really from the studies that have been done for years and years and years, there is an underestimation of the blood alcohol concentration um, from a breath test. Okay. So, you know, again, the breath test is, is got a built-in potential benefit of the doubt that favors the defendant. Correct. Okay. Um, another question, it's COVID times, people using hand sanitizer all the time. It, it, it's, if a, if a law enforcement officer or a defendant who's in the breath testing room uses hand sanitizer, is that gonna cause any disruption in the quality of the breath test that you get? Because a lot of those are, I mean, are, are highly alcohol, not drinking liquor, but alcohol based. Well, and a lot of them do have ethyl alcohol in them. Um, it's a kind you mean of- mean I can start part. drinking that stuff? No, because it's got stuff that'll make you sick. I no. would not advise it. Then I but won't. Here, here's what two, two parts of that question, two answers to that question. One, if you do this rubbing on your hands um, mm -hmm. and then go someplace five minutes later and get breath tested, you're not going to see a result. You, okay. The body is very inefficient at absorbing alcohol through the skin. Uh, they did a test years ago where they had grad students wearing hip boots. They filled the hip boots up with vodka and let them stand around in them. And then they drew blood out of their arm and they couldn't get a measurable alcohol concentration in the blood when they're standing in hip boots full of vodka. So you won't get it. If you're in the breath testing room, you don't want to have it in there simply because it will be flagged as an ambient. Okay, so an ambient fail is like when they paint the jail or they use wax strip or something, they put volatile organic compounds in the air. Um, if the instrument samples the air, and that's what it always does on that air blank, is sn sniff in the air to say, is there anything out here I have to be worried about? If it detects it, it's going to flag it as an ambient condition. Use of hand sanitizers like that should be done in a different room. It's not going to it's not going to skew the defendant's result. It just may delay or compromise the testing by causing, you know, you have to get a fan, you got to do something else to ventilate the room. Okay. Next question. You talked a little bit about GERD. Are you familiar with laryngopharyngeal reflux disease? That that's GERD. Okay. So that, it's essentially the same thing, L P R D and GERD or essentially the same. It's whenever it's backing up from your stomach and coming back out. Well, that's, that... that's what reflux is, is when you're erping out of the stomach. Okay, all right, very good. Um, hang on a second, I got one more question for you. Okay, you see advertised on the internet uh, pills that are gonna help you sober up immediately. Is there um, any such animal? Because I need they, to know where to get them when I get done drinking my hand sanitizer. <laughs> there, there's nothing that's ever been developed that would do that. There were some studies a long time ago where they found that um, the uh, toxic doses of fructose would accelerate elimination, but then you have to deal with the issue of getting a fructose first of all, and, and then you're going to have to consume toxic amounts. Um, uh, the simplest way of, of assuring people there isn't a solution to it out there is that if there was something that could magically erase alcohol from the system, they would be giving it to these kids. And I know it's typically uh, college age kids that do lethal amounts of alcohol from mm -hmm. the parties. They would be administering it to them if there's a magic eraser that would take the alcohol out of the system. They're, that animal just doesn't exist. So there's no Narcan-like su uh, substance that brings you back from an alcohol debt, is it? No, it may make you somehow like a cup of coffee may make you think you feel better and then you are better, but it's not doing anything to the alcohol. 
So the waffle, waffle House is just good. It's not the cure. Waffle House is good for social social meetings. <laughs> and during hurricanes, God bless them. They're there for it. <laughs> All right. Well, Paul, I've got two o'clock. That was great. And as you always are great. And I appreciate it. And, you know, I, I, probably folks that are not routinely in the courtroom think what sort of crazy stuff goes on in there. But crazy stuff goes on in there and crazy stuff has to be responded to. And we appreciate you. Thank you. Paul, thanks again. Uh, and uh, Sarah, I really appreciate you handling the, the Q and there, uh, Q&A there. I want to thank Paul for her presentation, for Sarah, for her participation, to everybody who joined us today. Uh, if you will, before the meeting, um, take a chance to use the Q&A window. If you have any suggestions on um, how you'd like us to improve this webinar series for future presentations, including any future topics you'd like to learn about. Um, following today's webinar, as a reminder, you'll receive an email with a with the recording link, so be sure to watch for that. In that email, we'll also include a link if you'd like to request a webinar participation certificate. Um, so it's very important. Um, don't send me an email. Just uh, wait for wait for my me to send you the email. Then just click on that link, fill in your um, request, and we'll get that to you. Uh, please make note, if you happen to be watching this recording right now and not the live webinar, we can only provide certificates to those folks who participated in the live webinar. We invite you to join us again for other traffic safety webinars planned for the series. Um, so visit our website at this link below to, uh, for a listing of our upcoming webinars. At the same website, you'll also find information about our next North Carolina Traffic Safety Conference and Expo. Uh, we hope you will uh, plan to attend the conference and we invite you to propose topics for presentation at the conference. Uh, you'll find a link on the website for presentation proposals uh, that you can uh, submit your ideas. So with that, I wanna thank everybody again for joining us today. Until next time, goodbye for now.